Uh, we hope you're enjoying the relative peace and quiet of uh, a return to school for your children uh, or looking forward to that as and when they reach school age. Uh, if they're not there yet, uh, I guess 12 months will probably fly by uh, if we're out of lockdown fairly shortly. Um, over the course of the next 20 minutes or so, uh, James and I will run through some of the key considerations uh, in how to pay for your child's education uh, before taking questions uh, at the end, as, as Guy said. Uh, this is very much a summary of the considerations which need to be accounted for when deciding how to do cover the cost of education uh, in the short term, rather than a, a, a deep dive, so to speak. Uh, and it's designed really to give you food for thought uh, in enabling you to put forward uh, and put together uh, the right savings strategy to meet your child's education costs. Uh, as already mentioned, this is more of a headline summary and we can cover off uh, specific questions in the Q&A um, or under separate cover after this event. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, Bruin Dolphin was established in 1762. and uh, We're one of the largest independently owned wealth managers in the UK. Uh, we have over 42 billion pounds of funds under management, 32 offices across the UK and Channel Islands and a long history of working in partnership with our clients and their advisors to achieve financial planning solutions. Um, James and I have split the key considerations into uh, a number of sections, uh, kicking off with understanding the likely costs of education. Uh, the next three or four just cover off the, the various component parts of a suitable savings strategy. And then we look at how to bring those considerations together under, under one coherent strategy for you all. Um, as you may have guessed, and as, as Guy alluded to there, education can be uh, a costly business. Uh, many parents, uh, and indeed increasingly grandparents too, are very happy to make financial sacrifices to ensure that their children receive the best education. Uh, a good many though leave thinking about how they will fund uh, education until the child is about to start school. Uh, by then, savings options are, are, are reasonably limited. Um, therefore, the cost of your child's education uh, is likely to become less of a burden and less of a concern if you start planning as early as possible. Um, clearly, the most important question, and maybe the first question you, you, you need to ask, is how much that education is going to cost, uh, especially when putting together the plan of action. Working out how you are likely to need, how much you're likely to need, uh, will enable you to put a picture of uh, the annual expense and total costs over the course of time and put the proverbial building blocks into place for a savings plan. Uh, based on the 2020 Independent Schools Council census, the ISC, uh, the average cost of sending a child to private day school is now over £15,000 per annum, uh, accounting for school fee inflation, which is around 35 to 4% per annum on average. The average cost of privately educating a child in day school between the ages of four and 18 is a total of around £215,000 over the course of, of their school life. Um, key to planning, as, as, as I said, is to, to make sure that you have the sufficient building blocks in place to enable that sum of money to be met over time. Um, the second question you may need to ask uh, is uh, a reasonably difficult one, and that's what if it is too much? What if 215,000 or so is too much? Um, and difficult though, difficult though that is necessarily to get to grips with, forward planning may actually indicate that uh, it may not be possible to cover the costs of the education that you would have wanted for your child at outset, especially given the current climate. Um, in those circumstances, uh, you may have to explore other options, and that includes uh, a number of things, um, not necessarily going private through the entirety of your child's education, uh, potentially considering secondary school only or, or sixth form, potentially considering your child, uh, sending your child to a different school. Uh, fees vary considerably depending on the prestige of the establishment and where it is in the country. Uh, as Guy mentioned earlier, the average day school in the Northwest charges uh, around 10, 10 and a half, 11,000 pounds per annum, compared to 17 or so uh, a year for a school in London. Um, the availability of scholarships and bursaries is also worth investigating. Um, according to the ISC census in 2018, uh, almost a third of school pupils receive some assistance with fees, uh, mostly from the school itself. Um, and some schools may offer a discount for advanced funding. Uh, for those of you lucky enough to have seen the first couple of, of webinars that, that Bruin Dolphin were involved in, um, there are a number of options um, to, to consider there, um, albeit that uh, schools are not necessarily discounting as much as they were in the past. Um, you may be able to arrange a sibling discount as well if you have more than one child at a school. Uh, I'll hand over now to James uh, who will run through various component parts of a suitable saving strategy 
uh, before we conclude with the Q&A. Morning, everyone. Um, it's really important that you um, start the process by looking at the, the savings that you have already. Um, many, many parents will have um, investments in place which will, for other things, repaying the mortgage or for retirement and so on. And it may be necessary to dip into these assets to, to help pay for school fees. But it's really important that the, the, the strategy that's been adopted in the past is reviewed. Um, pensions and um, retirement is long term. School fees, money is needed much quicker, much sooner. So it's really important to review the investment strategy, the risk strategy, because funds that are going to be needed quite soon um, it, it, it doesn't make sense to take an enormous amount of risk with those funds. But if you're planning earlier and you've got a few years before the children go to school, you then can take, can take more risk. So it's really important to review the existing investment strategy. It's also important to um, you know, use, use some sort of science behind how much your school fees are going to cost. You can't predict accurately because no one knows what's going to happen in the future with inflation and so on. But by using cash flow modelling, you can get a pretty good idea about um, how much you need to invest now um, to pay the school fees um, you know, throughout your children's um, education. It's really important to make use of allowances. ISAs um, are really, really good. Um, any income or growth is tax free and they're flexible so you can put money in and take money out. They work really, really well for school fees planning. Um, I'd also suggest reviewing any existing general investments or direct investments that you have. Um, if you have investments that are sitting on gains, even after coronavirus, there are still people out there with gains. Um, it's worth taking a look to see um, if you should utilise your annual capital gains tax allowance. And possibly even if you have gains over and above your annual capital gains tax allowance, I think it's worth looking um, at realising some gains. Now, there are, there's lots of talk that um, the Chancellor might make changes to capital gains tax um, and align the very generous capital gains tax rates that we have at the moment with income tax rates, which will result in a significant increase in capital gains tax for people who are sitting on gains over and above their allowances. So it's really worth looking at the allowances, maybe shifting assets between spouses to make use of allowances and so on. Um, we've covered this in previous um, webinars, but grandparents, uh, David alluded to this, that grandparents are generally quite willing to help pay for school fees. Um, inheritance tax planning and school fees planning works really really well together um, you can effectively create a 40 percent discount on school fees by being able to gain access to money that otherwise would be subject to inheritance tax and certainly the clients that we speak to that there's there's lots of, 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 of desire to help um, with grandchildren's uh, school fees and that's a really good way of um, of, of, of paying the school fees and also reducing the long-term inheritance tax impact for those who are willing to help. Um, now, what do you do if you don't have any liquid assets or you have assets that are tied up? You might have a property that you can't sell that you wanted to sell to pay for school fees and so on. Well, mortgages are quite a useful um, way at the moment. The rates on mortgages have come down dramatically. Um, that might be mortgages um, for the parents who have um, not no mortgage at the moment and are, are able to to leverage their house to, to, to raise some money to pay school fees. Um, if you have a very low, very low loan to value, mortgage rates at the moment are very, very, very low uh, and are probably going to stay low, I suspect, for, for the time being. Um, grandparents can consider equity release. Again, um, equity re release rates are down to between sort of two and a half and three percent for life. Um, they've come down dramatically from where they were two or three years ago. So that's also a very, very good way of, of, of you know, funding school fees where there aren't the liquid assets available. Um, the first thing I think parents should do though, when they're looking at um, pre-planning for school fees, um, is looking at what happens if one or both of the parents um, you know, were taken ill or, or sadly died. Um, protection for people in their 30s and 40s, which is probably the ages we're, we're talking about, um, parents funding school fees, it's unlikely much later than that, but it, but it might be. Um, but that's typically the age. Life cover is very, very cheap for those who are in good health. So it really makes sense to put in place um, some protection, a lump sum maybe, to, to, to cover the school fees in the event that um, one or, or both parents die. Um, income can also be protected. There's um, a, a plan called an income protection plan, which um, can, can provide um, one with income if they are long-term sick and unable to um, 
work and, and therefore earn their salary. Um, many employers um, will offer life cover and protection schemes. And if you have a, a, a sort of flex benefits type arrangement, it's, it's worth looking at implementing protection through your employer because if you can pay it out of gross pay, it's much more effective than you paying for personal cover um, out of income that's been taxed and taxed and, and, and suffered national insurance. So there's lots of employers out there that will um, offer very, very flexible packages. And I think that's the starting point. Um, but for protection, I think you need protection in addition to protection for the mortgage or to leave the survivor with a, an income. Um, it, it, it should be really earmarked, I think, for school fees. Um, and as I said earlier, it's, it's not particularly expensive. So that for me is the starting point. Um, in the financial plan and then from there you build out with your assets and your cash flow modeling and so on um i think that's me uh done david i'll, I'll pass back to you thanks jamie um as we we're talking about I, th I think ultimately um and as we'll probably come on to in the q a just from from uh, the, the the questions that were put in in advance um ultimately I, I think the key to to the right level of planning is is i suppose what we would refer to as thinking in the round um, and that's really funding the cost of education from from various sources. Um, many parents and uh, or many clients of ours who are parents of, of children going through through private education will fund the cost of education from a variety of sources, which may be earned income, um, part earned income, part savings accrued prior to the child starting school, and partly from financial assistance from grandparents. Uh, and the key is that advanced planning and trying to put together. Um, almost a, a roadmap so to speak uh, or at least a monetary roadmap um, for clients who, who, who are in this process um, we use cash flow analysis to help establish what the the implications of drawing on particular assets might be on future plans and also put together um, an idea of what uh, and when may, certain monetary figures may be required um, the brilliance of cash flow planning is that it helps demonstrate what might need to be saved at outset uh, and invested, the level of risk you may need to take and the sorts of returns that you may need to achieve on, on what you can afford to save before the child goes to school. Um, and also helps consider the options available in terms of, of where and how to release assets at the time, be that an ISA uh, portfolio, uh, potentially a pension uh, towards the end of a child's education and, and, and subject to um, the rules around that or borrowing against um, property. Um, just quickly before coming to the Q&A, a few contact details there and on the uh, initial slide, um, thanks to the wonders of modern technology, um, you can scan the QR code on the, on the right hand side there uh, and that will give, uh, give you uh, our contact details um, if you want to follow up afterwards uh, and I know Guy will, will do that. Um, Guy, if you will, you're ready to, to take Q&A, uh, let's fire away. So to speak. Absolutely, do you want to turn off your uh, presentation? Yeah. Hopefully that's Great. done it. Thanks. So we've got uh, a huge number of questions already. Um, so the first one uh, actually relates sort of rather directly to cash flow. Uh, someone's asking um, that their school fees are likely to be around 15k a year for the next 10 years, uh, obviously before inflation. Uh, am I better off holding that entire amount in cash where possible so I know I'll be able to afford it? Um, I, I, I'll take that, Jamie, if that's okay. Um, I, I think it's a combination of things and, and you know, yes, certainly as far as holding cash is, is concerned that that is safe in inverted commas. Um, it's not going to fall in, in physical value, but it may fall in, in real value. Um, and with school fees increasing by, by 4% per annum or so, clearly there's a, there's a degree of, of the erosion of the real value of those monies. Um, and I think that's, that's probably the key in terms of factoring in uh, an appropriate financial plan. So you, it could be that you hold three to five years in cash um, and then look at how investments can assist in the increase in value without necessarily taking significant risk so that you're maintaining the real buying power, particularly in relation to school fee increases of that capital over, over what we would deem to be a, a, a long-term investment plan. Um, equally, it's conceivably worth asking the school if, if the cash is available, um, whether or not a significant chunk of the of the fees could be paid up front um, and, and therefore getting a discount uh, as I mentioned in the intro um, because interest rates are so low at the moment the the amount of discounts that, that schools are willing to to provide are, are not necessarily as attractive as they once were but uh, if you don't ask you don't get so to speak 
Okay, now there's a question about saving strategies that uh, Chang Lung uh, submitted in advance, um, which is about uh, whether you should, how you balance out uh, adventure, adventurousness versus risk. Uh, uh, in, in, in other words, I think what the question is asking, uh, you know, like, like how risky should you be with your strategies to save for school fees? Sure. Um, I, I mean, I, I think, and, and feel free to dip in as well, Jamie. Um, I mean, I, th I think a lot of it comes down to, to a combination of, of affordability, what, you're, what, you're, what you have available for school fee planning versus what you need. So if I go back to that example at the beginning, you know, if you're, if you're somebody that's, you know, looking at that £215,000 and you have, you know, you're in the early stages of paternity leave and the child's two weeks old, you've got four years of planning before that fee is, before the first fee is due. Um, that gives you a, a consider that gives you four years before you even need to call on the money, plus the ability to save going forward. The 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 plan that's put into place for that person is going to be very different to somebody um, like me, for argument's sake, who has a, a child who's on day three of private education, and it's it's you know it's only clear over the last couple of years that that that's the route that we we we've, we've gone down. Um, so I've had a bit of jiggery jiggery pokery in my own planning, um, so I can speak from from a sweaty brow experience of of you know, putting that planning into place uh, and trying to strike a balance between saying, right, how do I cover the first couple of years? What am I willing, what can I afford from income? What do I need to take risk-wise to say I can cover, you know, she's 11, how do I cover 16, 17, 18 and, and go from there? And I, I'd add to what David just said, I think it does depend on where you are. If you're, if you have young children, you have a long-term time horizon, um, you, you, you can afford to take more risk um, because you might have five or six years before the, the, the fees are going to start to be to be paid um, so that gives you um, that gives you the, the ability to be able to accept more risk than somebody else who's starting to pay school fees now um, and doesn't have that time horizon I think if you're if you if you're if you're starting now with school fees and they're immediate I think in the first two or three years you might look at paying from cash or, or looking at prepayment schemes in my experience um, the prepayment schemes look quite good, but actually when you do the numbers, you're really only getting a, a discount a, a, akin to the, the interest that you would get on deposit. Um, so be careful about um, prepaid schemes. They, 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 you, know, they, they, you need to look under the bonnet really to make sure you're getting value. But certainly, you know, one to fees in one year one to three, immediate fee paying, cash, four, five and beyond, I think you can afford to take risk. But one of the things that we would do is combine cash flow planning with risk profiling to try and um, to try and get the, the the best sort of answer, um, the, the balance between risk and reward. Um, David alluded to it earlier on when he answered the, the question about holding cash. Yes, you, you you need to hold cash, but cash will be destroyed over time by inflation. At four five percent per annum, it will be destroyed. So, for the for the fees in the latter years, you want to get them working harder. And, and uh, the, the effect of a compound interest return over five to ten years is very powerful. So it depends where you are in your cycle um, to, 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 to how much risk you should take. But everybody will probably take an element of risk within their plan. It just depends where you are as to how much risk you'll take. Okay, that's, that's, that's great. Carl Bloom's just put in a question saying, uh, if you're looking four or five years out, uh, what type of investments would you look at? ISIS? Uh, yeah, I mean, sorry. No, go on, Dave. Go on. Um, uh, we'll, hopefully, I'll say the same thing, otherwise, we'll be hugely embarrassed. Um, I, I think the reality of, you know, ISIS normally are the first port of call for, for savings because of the tax efficiency. All returns are tax free, whether that's growth or, or interest or capital return or interest. Um, and I think. The, the the key with that is making sure that you have an ISA that's accessible. Um, conceivably, and depending on, on the values, clearly you've got to be able to save £20,000 or more to be able to look at something other than an ISA. But yeah, normally um, in a very generic world, ISAs are the first port of call because of the tax efficiency, ease of access, and the ability to have a wide range of investments from yeah. cash to, to high risk if, you're, if your appetite or your need is such. And, and I would add to that, if you're, if you're lucky enough to have assets of more than 20 or 40,000, if, if you're a couple, um, everybody has a capital gains tax allowance. At the moment, everybody has a capital gains tax allowance and a dividend allowance. So 
Um, you can invest quite a lot of money directly, um, which would normally suffer tax, um, tax efficiently by utilizing dividend allowances and utilizing capital gains tax allowances. That, this might all change um, soon, in, in November possibly, um, because the, the government are desperately looking at ways of repaying the debt built up via, through coronavirus. But at the moment, um, utilizing capital gains tax allowances and ISAs um, is, is a great way. You, you can then stray into things like offshore bonds. They, for me, are for much longer term planning or for grandparents. They're very, very attractive um, instruments for grandparents who are helping to fund uh, school fees. Not so for parents um, because of the tax rules, but very, very efficient for grandparents using trusts. So that's, we would use everything that's there. It's basically a toolkit of, of, of things that are available and we would fit a client's circumstances around the, the options that are available and the allowances that are available. You shouldn't pay, be paying too much tax, really, for school fees planning. Where you've got a couple, you've got all the allowances available. Um, it should be possible to, to, to pay the fees with very little tax um, being paid. And that's, that's really the art of all of this. Um, Alison Sedgwick asked, what's the best structure for managing fees uh, when you're expecting to use an annual bonus to pay? Um, I, I, I suppose in some respects, it's, you know, we're talk, talking again about that cash flow, um, you know, if, if the majority of, of your, your, um, your assets or the majority of what you're going to use to cover school fees comes through once a year or, or every six months, whatever it may be, um, again, it's, it's just planning the timing of it. So if you've, if you've got, um, you know, again, maybe one to two years of school fees, you can keep in cash. Uh, you know, again, it depends on your appetite for risk. If, if bonuses are such that they're akin to two, three years of fees, then you know, clearly the first year you get that and you've got your liability, you know you've got that liability for the next seven years. You've got three years worth in the bank. Try and make it sweat in terms of, of get a better, uh, as best interest rate as possible. If it's annually and you get the second bonus, then you can either top it up and say, well, I've got, I've got another three years to add to, um, to my school fee pot. Equally, by then, you may feel comfortable that you've got, you know, you see the money going out each month by a direct debit in terms of the fees. Um, and you may feel more comfortable allocating some of that, ex, you know, the second bonus and the third and the fourth or whatever bonus to things like, to, to things like ISAs and, and, you know, what could conceivably be longer term investments. Um, because actually, um, whilst you're maybe in the maelstrom of, of, of school fee planning and, and bringing up a child or bringing up children from, from 0 to 18 or 21 and so on, eventually they will be off your hands and eventually they may even be off the payroll. Um, and part of the planning that we want to put into place for clients is, is to actually not leave their own financial plan sort of semi-destroyed by such a focus on school fee planning, but that actually parents can come out the other side, so to speak, with monies in ISAs, money in pensions, money in portfolios using, using tax allowances, where they stay where they are, but they just simply have a different emphasis. So a school fees pot suddenly becomes retirement pot. Um, so it's, it's taking all these things into the round. Okay, someone was asking... Well, I, I, I would just oh, sorry, add to that, sorry Guy, I would just add to that, is if there are assets that are already available um, to pay school fees, it, it, can, it can pay to, to actually use bonuses to you know, make pension contributions. Uh, that can be very efficient. Now, you can't necessarily use that money um, for school fees unless you're of a certain age. But what it does do, it takes care of your later retirement planning and gives you a cushion and allows you to use money that's maybe sitting in cash or in personal investments now, which you had in for pensions. Um, it sort of, it, it covers that eventuality. So again, we would we would look at everything that's available. Grandparents can use pensions as well if they're, if they're still working and they can get money aside and, you know, save tax and national insurance, get money into pensions and then take it out efficiently to help with school fees. So there's everything's on the table, really, I would say. OK, so, so uh, this is a quite specific question about a certain kind of asset. Um, Amanda had asked, um, what are the options regarding using a rental property to pay for fees? Should they sell it uh, or put the property into a company or, you know, What's the best thing they can do if they've got a rental property? So I take that, out, David, and and please chip in if 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 you sure. if, I, if I'm floundering. Um, 
I mean, the, the obvious thing is to look at the rental income that comes off um, the property. If there's a, a surplus rental income, um, if there's no mortgage on the property and it's a good level of income, that it makes sense to use that. Um, that that's, uh, renting properties aren't quite as tax efficient as they used to be for higher rate taxpayers, um, but there's still some reliefs available and, and that would work. Um, selling the property, well, that, that's very difficult to, to, to say. Um, that depends on whether there's a capital gains tax liability. And at the moment, um, capital gains tax on property is 18% for the basic rate taxpayers and 28% for higher rate taxpayers. Now, as I said earlier on, if we get an increase in the rates on capital gains tax and they're aligned to income tax rates, depending on the gain on the property, that could mean that the top the top tax rate on a, on, a, on, a, on a gain on a property could be 45%, um, and it's currently 28. So um, it might be an opportune time, if you're thinking of selling a, a rental property, to review that strategy, um, because uh, the tax rates could increase dramatically um, if, if the Chancellor does indeed make changes to capital gains tax. Um, but generally speaking, um, I've... Property is difficult for school fees planning. It's very, you can't really sell a bit of a property. Um, but if you sell your property, you can then reinvest the money in things that you can sell bits of. So um, it, it, to answer the question, it really depends where you are. Have you got a capital gains tax liability? If it's significant, I'd review it sooner rather than later um, because of the potential changes. But very simply, income being thrown off a rental property, you know, 15 to 20,000 pounds a year of, of net income from property is, is a good way of, of, of paying school fees. But like everything else, um, you really need advice and property. You really need, um, I think, to talk to a financial planner and perhaps a lawyer as well, um, because there are implications of selling properties and so on. And there's, there's new rules on when you have to pay capital gains tax now on properties. It's much sooner than it used to be. So all the things we're talking about will we'll need advice. I think I think just just finishing off there, Jamie. I, I think this is you know this probably highlights the how different every individual's needs are, how different parents are, are, you know, what circumstances they are, and how important having a review of of aims, objectives, finances, and so on um, is. Um, and obviously, that's that's sort of proverbial bread and butter for us. Uh, uh, and and for those listening who've already got financial advice and so on, you know, that that's. It just goes to highlight the importance of having that that guide that guiding hand behind. Okay, so if, um, a, a bunch of questions about savings. Um, so maybe we we'll, uh, tackle first of all uh, pension contributions. Um, someone's not saying, I, yeah, I maximise my pension contributions every year with any spare cash I have, and I'll take the full twenty five percent lump sum for retirement to cover the cost of school fees. Is that wise? Um, I, I, I'll take that if that's okay, Jamie. Um, I mean, I, I think it's certainly become um, maybe a more common consideration, perhaps given um, the pension freedoms uh, or the changes in pension legislations, which have, have come under the banner of pensions freedoms uh, over the past 10, 15 years. Um, essentially now one can take what you like from, from a pension, when you like, how you like, uh, with a, a reasonable amount of tax considerations. But uh, uh, at the moment, for, for certainly for money purchase defined contribution pensions, once you reach 55, which is the minimum age you have to be to be able to access your pension, um, you're allowed to take 25% as a, as a lump sum. Um, I, I think the difficulty, is, as Jamie mentioned earlier, is this, this conundrum between the, the beauty of pension contributions, which is getting tax income tax relief at your highest marginal rate. So you're, you know, if you're a 40% taxpayer, a hundred pounds in your pension costs you 60. That's a pretty, pretty attractive uplift, but it needs to be balanced with the fact that you've still got to pay some of that income tax back when you draw a pension. Um, and the fact that actually once it's in there, you can't touch it until you're 55. Um, so for me, for example, at 43 and with an 11 year old, pension contributions look great, but not for school fee planning because well, unless she, she stays at school until she's 23. Um, so it, it sort of ruled out in that respect. Um, and that's why, again, just, just going back to, to the question that um, Carla, I think you said, um, asked about, you know, do I start with ISAs? Quite often in, in terms of general savings, we'll be talking about pension versus ISA and the brilliance of, of 
having this, this dual approach potentially is having ISAs where you don't get tax relief going in. So your hundred pounds is a hundred pounds, but you can get that money when you like versus a pension where your 60 bit or your hundred costs you 60, but you can't touch it until you're 55. So the two essentially run alongside and, and uh, but the tax treatment of the money while it's invested is the same. No tax deducted on growth in ISAs uh, or income in ISAs, same with the pension. Um, and I think, as, again, without sounding like a broken record, or if I am, I apologise, the, the individual circumstances of, of aims, needs, objectives and requirements will determine the, the, the suitability of that sort of plan. I think I'll add, just add a little bit there on, on pensions. Be careful. Um, yes, you can take 25% from a pension in the majority of cases, but we recommend these days that people take not necessarily the 25% in one go. That brings a lot of money back into your estate, which can worsen the inheritance tax position. So often we suggest taking tax-free cash in stages. Um, that's a much more efficient way of doing it. However, uh, there's a theme running through this webinar. It's review. Review your pensions because you might have old-fashioned pensions that only allow you to take a lump sum and only allow you to buy an annuity. You know, they might not have the flexible options that were bought in five years ago. And that's not necessarily a problem because you can move that pension to an arrangement that's flexible without any issues usually. But it's really important to, 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 to look at the, the, the features of your existing pensions and all your arrangements to make sure that you're not locked in and you have all of the features that you need to be able to withdraw money flexibly. And again, um, either your own financial advisor or, or Brew and Dolphin talk to us and we will review these things for you and guide you in the right direction. Okay, so following up on, on the savings uh, questions, um, uh, someone says, I've, I've got a high salary and, and pay high rate additional ta rate tax. Uh, what's the most efficient way to, to, to save money for school fees? Um, I, I, again, it's a combination of things. I, I, I think obviously the, the difficulty that, that that individual has is they, they, you know, if, if, if much of their savings is derived from earned income, then they're already paying, it, it's coming net of 45% tax. Um, and so it's a combination of, of potentially, again, depending on ages, you know, from a textbook perspective, pension contributions for that individual are very attractive. Um, the difficulty being they can't get the money back uh, until they're 55. So actually for, for us, the, conceivably the school fee planning going forward would actually be looking at making use of very tax efficient allowances or um, tax efficient contracts, products, wrappers, whatever you want to call them. So that although that money has come net of income tax, then the amount of tax that individual pays going forward is minimized. So using an ISA allowance means the 20,000 pounds from excess savings isn't taxed again. Um, if they have a spouse or, or, or um, civil partner or whatever, who, who isn't an additional rate taxpayer, then we can make use of, as, as James conferred earlier, make use of things like the capital gains tax allowance. So the individual that's paying additional rate tax essentially passes the money for, for to be invested outside of a NICER. Um, and they use capital gains tax or dividend allowances accordingly. Um, and it, as I say, it's just striking that balance. Um, and it's, it's, it's a frustration, I think, um, of, of the tax regime that HMRC will look at someone who's paying 45% tax and say, aren't you lucky to pay 45% tax? Where the person paying 45% tax will say, why am I paying? <laughs> it's an outrage. So it's striking that balance. I think, I think just a, a little scenario that might help in this, in this case is um, if you have someone who is an additional rate taxpayer and is too young to be able to pull money out via pensions, um, something like a venture capital trust might work. It's, it's high risk. So it would only be for a proportion of the, the capital or the, or the money in the pot. Um, but you, you can get 30% tax relief um, with venture capital trust and you only have to hang on to the venture capital trust for five years um, and you get tax-free dividends um, over the period of, of the VCT. Um, it is high risk but it might be a solution for somebody who is paying 45% tax, wants to try and get some tax relief um, and, is, and has the risk, risk budget to be able to put some of their money in something that's pretty punchy when it comes to risk. Great, thanks. Actually, on, on, on that front, uh, Iron asked, asked a question, which I think I think I know the answer to, but I'll, I'll, I'll get the proper answer. Are there any direct tax allowances that can be claimed for school fees? 
uh, the short version is no, um, which is a deep irritation for many. Um, they're, they're, historically, there was something called the School Fees Educational Trust, which um, was, was around in the kind of 80s, 90s, which was a sort of tax efficient savings scheme type, type thing. Now it is, it is absolutely nothing. There is, there is no structure, um, no tax relief you can get. Um, it really comes down to that planning again. So, so talking, you know, again, going back to the, to, um, the, the, um, the viewer who asked about putting a residential property into a company per se, one of the reasons that people do that, although it's a disposal for tax purposes, which is a can of worms I won't open, um, one of the reasons for putting property or something into a company is that the money drawn out can be drawn out as dividends. Dividends are taxed at a lower rate than, than rental income. Um, so it's, a, it's about ways of looking at the tax efficiency. And although it's not tax relief per se, it is the ability to take money out tax efficiently at a lower rate of tax. Um, but no, the, the short version of, of the answer is no. I, think, I, I just think I agree with David on that, but I'll just remind the viewers about my comments earlier, for those who are willing to, to help, um, inheritance tax planning and school fees planning works brilliantly together. And if you can get that right, you can effectively save 40% on, on fees by getting money out of one's estate that would normally suffer 40% inheritance tax. So that's a really good, you know, that's a really good strategy to adopt and uh, one that um, in our, in our, you know, client base, lots of, lots of grandparents are helping in that way. And there's lots of options there, lots of ways of doing it. And I think that's something that does really help reduce the impact of parents' school fees for those who are lucky enough to be able to get help from, from their parents. We've got, several questions about grandparents um uh so 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 uh, what, what what one of the questions is that someone thinks their parents could help but they're not sure uh, how much they can give or lend and whether that would create issues for them in the future so how do we how do they work that one out um so so that that's where we go back to to cash flow modeling so we would we would look we would, would not just look at the um cash flow modeling for the school fees to see what the school fees are going to cost we'd look at the grandparent situation and say okay these are your assets if we took a hundred thousand out of these assets to help with school fees what impact is that going to have on your retirement and we use cash flow modeling to show um, fairly modest returns what what doing that taking that money out will do to the financial plan so it's very much um reviewing the grandparents position using cash flow modeling to make sure that they're not left short. Um, now, um, in terms of the impact of receiving gifts from grandparents, well, there's no tax in initially. Um, if you're given money from your parents um, or, 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 or the grandparents of, to the children, um, there's, no mon there's no tax in respect of the receipt. There's no income tax or capital gains tax to worry about. There is an issue if a gift is given um, to you and the, the person who gives you the gift dies within seven years. Um, that, that's a failed gift and that then forms part of the estate of the person who's died. And depending on how much um, the gift was, you could end up um, being asked to pay some tax back because um, as the receiver of the gift, as long, if it falls part of the nil rate band, it's fine, but larger gifts that exceed the nil rate band, there might be some tax to pay. Um, which is why we often uh, talk about insuring gifts, you know, getting, even getting the, 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 ch the parents of the children to take out a life insurance policy on the grandparent so that if they do die within seven years, there's some, some compensation for, for the tax that's resulted from the failed gift. It's quite complicated that, and I won't go into too much detail, but I would say, generally speaking, for the levels we're talking about, there's not really any implications. It doesn't affect the parent's income uh, you know, they don't have to put anything on the tax return. They receive the capital, they use it, and there's only a potential issue if death occurs within seven years of the, the grandparent giving the money. David, I don't know if you've got any... James, on that, on, on that front, can I just ask a follow-up question? If, if, yeah. if, the, if the grandparents are, are very different ages and have very different health outcomes, um, uh, likely health, health outcomes, um, uh, is a gift from one of them or is it from both of them? How does that work? It's, it's, it's a choice and, and we would normally suggest that the younger, healthier grandparent makes the, the gift, particularly if we are insuring the potential 
liability in seven years because it's 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 going to be much much cheaper for a younger healthier individual if 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 they're both a similar age and similar health i would make joint gifts uh, particularly where trusts are concerned mm -hmm. because you've got implications of putting money in trust you can only put a certain amount in discretionary trusts and if you've got grandparents rather than a grandparent you can get twice the amount away into a trust so um yeah it's a good question and and uh, yeah in, in circumstances where you've got a younger much healthier individual generally speaking they would make the gift okay so so uh, i've got a bunch of questions about uh, protection which you alluded to a bit earlier um, um so someone's asked if, uh, we've got life covered through work uh, and to cover the mortgage but we're not sure whether we should also take out protection to cover school fees my my view is that that the life cover through work is, is is likely to be or could be needed as a capital sum to provide provide income for the survivor. If you've got young children and one of the parents dies, presumably um, you know there's some childcare needs for the survivor might not be able to get a full time job or get a, the job that they would want because they have to look after children. And I think the the, the life cover through work covers that. The mortgage cover covers the mortgage. So my view is taking out standalone cover for school fees is sensible. It's not expensive. You could buy reducing cover to, to, to cover a reducing school fees liability. Um, and I just think where affordable, um, it, it just gives the family peace of mind that if something happens to the parents, the school fees are gonna be covered. You know, there's no issue. The mortgage is paid off and there's a pot of money for the family to live on. Great, thanks. And uh, on, on that front, um, how does school fees protection work? Uh, it's, well, it's just essentially, um, there's various ways of doing it. It depends what you're insuring. If you're insuring um, a lump sum, you can take out a very, very um, low cost um, protection through most major insurers. Um, it's not expensive, it's usually straightforward in terms of underwriting um, because the people being underwritten are usually fairly young and healthy. Um, but it might be that you, you go back to your employer first. This is the, 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 the thing I mentioned earlier on. You might have your death in service, but there might be a way of flexing your benefits to increase your death in service. You might not want some of the other things that your employer offers and you can up your life cover you know by the amount you need for your school fees um you might want to cover your income you, you know you might if you're worried about becoming ill um and not being able to work um an income protection scheme again your employer is likely to offer that large employers are likely to offer that not so many small employers necessarily um but i would go back to my company first and foremost and see what benefits i can secure out of gross income first because anything you pay out of tax and income for private cover is more expensive and um getting it through your employer the underwriting is likely to be much easier so that's my first port of call go to my employer up my cover see what's available get that through the employer and anything you can't get through your employer or they don't offer or you, it, it, it doesn't make sense then private cover can be taken and you come to firms like brewing dolphin who advise you ha you know on the types of policies that you should take out and take and hold your hand through the process I think you've just there uh, answered. Uh, I mean, the moment we mentioned cover, uh, Lee Hutchinson and Olga, very uh, pressured, and both both had questions that were about sort of how and where. And I think what you're saying really is so is, is go to your employer first, and if not, come to someone like Bryn Dolphin. So, yeah, yeah, get right. get get anything you can through employment because it's always yeah. likely to be cheaper and easier to set up. Okay. Now, so if you're thinking of move, if you're thinking of moving jobs soon. And you're a sort of person who moves around a lot. You might want a bit of private cover in the background just to, you know, avoid that. But I think the employer is the first port of call, which isn't great for firms like Brewing Dolphin. But that's the right answer. You know, that is the right answer. Yeah. Um, so, uh, just a, a sort of final question so far on that on that front. So, if you don't have protection and you die, uh, your children no longer have to go to the same school. David, do you want to? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it's conceivable. I mean, I think, I think the difficulty is, is obviously, you know, if, if, if the surviving partner or the surviving spouse 
is then with no protection is then essentially trying to cover school fees out of, of whatever they earn or whatever assets are, are left. Um, and I think for us is always, you know, there's a reason it's called life insurance or, or income insurance um, because it, it's insurance to cover the, the worst case scenario. Um, and I think it's, it's important sometimes to try and get around the psychology of, um, you know, insur I think people view, income protection and life assurance in a very different way to the way they do car insurance or home insurance. You insure your home by default because if the roof blows off or it falls down, you know you've got money there to rebuild it and live in. People look at life insurance and income protection as a kind of last, a sort of last port of call or something, well, the chances of something happening to me are minimal. That doesn't mean it, they're not going to happen. And I think when it comes to, um, again, you know, parental instinct is to put your children first to put protection in place to make sure actually the surviving spouse has sufficient money either as an income which is, which is through something called family income benefit or as a lump sum to cover school fees or whatever it may be um is is you know arguably a really responsible and and worthwhile thing to do um and all being well you know uh, and again put myself in my shoes all being well i'll get to my youngest leaving school and my policy can end and i'll be very happy that it's money that I'll never see again, but at least I'm alive to see the kids. And, and I, I mean, knew that had something happened, I was okay. Yeah. Well, they were okay. I mean, over, over a period of 10 years on a, on a decreasing term insurance basis, because you, the liability doesn't stay flat. The, li the school fees liability goes down. So, I mean, quite often a level term insurance policy is as cheap as a decreasing one anyway, so you might as well go for that. But you can, you can, you, you can get policies to cover reasonable amounts at young, you know, relatively young ages for not much money. And the, the, the implications of not doing it are catastrophic and, and the cost of, uh, uh, is minimal. So um, it's, it's, I think it's the starting point, really, when you're looking at school fees planning is do we need, you know, if you've got wealthy, wealthy parents, you've got lots of assets, it's not so much of an issue. These, this is essential for people who have no one else they can rely upon. Um, they don't really have a great, they have good income, but don't really have great assets. And if one of the breadwinners passes away, that could result in the children not going to the school anymore. Now, I know there are potentially ways of getting help from schools, but I, that's going to be limited, I suspect. Actually, can I butt in there a second? Um, I mean, I think catastrophic is perhaps overselling it, James. The, uh, uh, the thing to bear in mind is that most independent schools in the UK are charities. They do have yeah. funds available for and they, and they and they try very very hard to look after their yeah. own. So so once you once you're in a school, and you know if something happens to your to your uh, that, that really drastically affects your ability to pay, it's amazing how good a lot of schools are with that. And oh, so, that's good to know. Yeah. Yeah. So 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 um, and then the other thing to bear in mind is we do have a state system as well. So so, yeah. so, 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 catastrophe is not quite the right word to do. No, this, but I mean, for, I mean yeah, that's, it that's looking at the overall. You know, not only have they lost a parent, they've they've had to leave a school, and it, you know, the whole yeah, position is yeah. is terrible. And um, it's just another thing that you probably don't want um, to have to worry about. Um, yeah. And you know, having cover in place takes that worry away. Yeah. So Olga's asked just to follow up on that. Uh, Olga asked a follow up question, which was that. Uh, uh, she, uh, as a single only parent uh, and she has income cover from her employer if something happens to her can she put her underage child as a receiver of a lump sum um, and uh, she, she notes whether this is relevant or not the rest of her family lives outside of the EU um, yeah I, yeah go on well I was going to say uh, the, if we're talking about the employer's death in service scheme which I think we probably are um, she, she, Olga would need to nominate who she wants to benefit for um for the lump sum should it you know should she pass away um for someone who's under age it would under 18 it would it would effectively sit in a sort of trust a trust arrangement until they were till they were 18 but absolutely and she should she should nominate her her children um to, to benefit from her uh, death in service um should should sadly she should she die okay so so let's move away from protection uh and uh to, to, to assets and, and different kinds of employment, different ways of paying, I guess. Um, uh, so Aaron's, I'm gonna put two questions together. So Aaron has asked is, can a company pay for school fees? Uh, and if so, is that tax deductible for the company? Uh, and then someone else has asked, uh, I'm self-employed. 
Uh, um, but I don't have any liquid assets. Is there a tax efficient way that I could borrow the money? These are different questions, but they're, but they're both about people who are not in employment, self-employed or, or have a company. Um, I, I, if I take the, the, the company one, um, I mean, the, the short version is, is um, there are technically there are ways that um, a company can pay directly for school fees, although we're, we're heading into the accountancy world. Um, the difficulty is that it's not normally particularly tax it, it, any, any different in terms of the tax efficiency for it. Um, so if it's part of a remuneration package, you'll still have income tax and, and national insurance to pay as will the employer. Um, if it's a if it's a company as we were referring to earlier, so if it's a, a company set up by a family, so a family company, um, conceivably you, you can minimise the um, you can minimise the tax that's due through dividend allowances, income tax allowances, and so on. But it doesn't necessarily it's not tax deductible in terms of, of corporation tax, for example, on profits. Um, I'm, I'm going into areas I'm, I'm not an expert on, but you know it's conceivable that, that um, certainly a parent should not set up the company because of something called the parental settlement rules, which is if, if the money is, has come from, if ultimately the money used has come from parents and, and sort of gone through the company to the children and that income is more than £100 a year, then it's taxed as the parents anyway. So sometimes what you'll see is, a, is grandparents invest, or either a family business that was created by generations prior to the parents used to pass children to become shareholders or children to pay dividends and so on to use their, their tax allowances. Um, but other than that, it's, it's pretty difficult to, um, to utilize a, a, a company in that way. Um, but again, if, you, if, if it's a company that exists and it's yours, it's definitely worth speaking to, to your, your corporate accountants to, to cover off ways and, ways and means. And this is something I covered in a previous webinar. I think um, up to ten thousand pounds for a short period of time is 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 viable in terms of taking a loan from a company. But it is a loan. Um, anything above that and for longer, it, it isn't particularly tax efficient. Um, and and you can get yourselves in all sorts of um, bother if if you don't fully understand the rules around borrowing from from your company. Um, just going back, I think the, the second part of that was the, the self-employed person with no liquid assets. Um, I think probably the only option there is if, if, if that person has a, an unencumbered property or a property with a, a low mortgage, um, borrowing is, 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 is an idea. Um, for someone who's self-employed, I mean, if you've been self-employed for years and you've got great books and you've got good income and you can demonstrate it, you, you won't have a problem. But for someone who's maybe got a fairly new business or has had a business that's been up and down and not, not necessarily delivered, um, you know, good returns over the years, um, you, you're probably wasting your time going down to going to the high street and talking to NatWest or Barclays or whatever. Um, you really need a, a mortgage broker who can um, probably help you get a mortgage that you probably don't think you can get in many cases, um, but you know, by just going to the high street. Again, this is, this is a theme here, get, get advice. Um, you know, you might pay a small fee um, for the advice. Often the fees are covered by the mortgage anyway, so there's not necessarily additional fees with mortgage brokers, but they're much more likely to be able to get you a mortgage um, and get you a good mortgage as well um, than, than you trying it yourself down, down, down at the high street. Brilliant. I, I, I'm going to kind of finish with some um, questions about, around the cost of education. Um, so, uh, Niranjan asked about whether all private schools have the same fee structure, which I think probably means about um, uh, ways of paying. Um, so there are obviously, I mean, there are different kinds of, I mean, the costs, as we discussed right at the very beginning, varies enormously in different parts of the country or in uh, different kinds of schools. So, 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 so the, the, there are different amounts of fees, but in terms of how, how you pay, um, whether you know anything about 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 that, um, um, but then um, uh, then also, uh, I guess, I mean, a really basic question: How do you work out whether you can afford private fees? Um, I mean, that really comes down to to cash flow um, and and saying right okay and and where you are in your in your financial and personal life if you're in a situation where you're um you know 
a, a super forward planner who's you know 30 just got married no kids but knows definitely that, that they want family and they want to be able to put them through private school then they might say you know well i do you know we'll have a kid at 35 they'll be at private school when i'm 39 how do i plan for for that and that comes back to the cash flow analysis and the, and the forward planning we spoke about equally you could be you know a 43 year old financial advisor with with an 11 year old who, who's a couple of or nine year 41 and a nine year old who's a, who starts thinking right okay actually private is a route that, that we're going to look at um and it's about looking and reviewing as, as james has said you know it's about reviewing where you are in your financial life at that point in time clearly if it's uh, if we're in a situation where with the best will in the world, it's not possible to fund the cost of that 215,000 that, that I mentioned earlier from four to 18, the, the perfect compromise might be saying, well, look, actually we can put together a plan that enables you to fund from 11 to 18 and depending on returns and, and, and the investment and the utilization and the tax efficiency of everything that you put into place, equally, it could be possible that you can, you can bring forward that 11 to maybe age nine or eight. So, so they start, you know, yes, later than four, but sooner than 11. And that comes down to a combination of um, the school you want, how the child is, whether they're settled at, you know, if they're in state primary and, and you may just leave them till, till 11. Um, and that, you know, I, I, without sort of overemphasizing the importance of having professional advice, a professional review and that, and that guiding hand behind. Um, needless to say, you know, it, it's part of the course of, of what James and I and our colleagues in financial planning do. Um, it's making sure that you don't get that nasty surprise. You can plan for every eventuality. And if we, you know, we may have to have a slightly awkward conversation of saying, look, it's just not possible to have your utopian objective met, but we can, we can do the next thing down. And it's not dissimilar to wider planning. You know, we've got often we'll get clients saying, you know, I want to retire at 55 on an income of X. You run the maths and it might not be possible to do it at 55. It might be 57. And it's, it's a, a different way of doing the same thing. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Um, so I, I, I think we've, we, we, it's um, 1129. So it's time to stop really. Thank you very much indeed for an amazing uh, set, set of specialist advice on a huge range of questions. Um, we uh, are deliberately going a bit slow with schools uh, to give them a few weeks to get settled into this new term. because obviously this is quite, quite a different term to normal. Um, so our first uh, schools event is in two weeks time at the same time on Tuesday the 22nd of September and this is the first of our into series in the UK where what we'll be doing is visiting uh, six leading schools from the southeast of England and doing a whistle stop tour of them in action and then you get the chance to drop into uh, uh, a chat with individual schools after after we've seen all six so this is a very very efficient way of looking at six schools in an hour uh, and uh, deciding which ones you actually need to visit. Um, so that's taking place on Tuesday 22nd of September uh, at 10.30 and I'd just like to say again thank you very much James and David for a really really interesting session. Thank you. Pleasure.